Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to Sleeping Dogs, and I just saw something flash. I think it could be a collectible, but it might have just been the shine of the rain. Alright, I guess so. Well, up here we have the uh, undercover headquarters of the local police, along with a health shrine. And hey, 10% more health. You can see how it works right there. You got the red bar, that's the normal bar. And then you got the bonus health bar, which is a blue bar on top of it. And hey, there was a lockbox collectible after all. Just not where I thought it was. Right, let's go do some police work. What are you doing here? I'm sure you and Penjo have a lot of top secret backdoor business to attend to. Look, I'm sorry about how I acted in there, you know, just playing the part. I'm already out there on the streets, I hear things like this ketamine racket. I'll see what I can dig up. How's that for an olive branch? serious? Just like that? Look, I'll help where I can. <laughs> what? I'm just a little shocked. I'm just used to Pendra's people being more like him. I just think we'd be better off helping each other. Come on, what do you say? I could really use the help if you're willing to give in. Well, all right. All right, let's get started on this ketamine racket. Okay, looks like we've got a lead. By the way, ketamine is a real drug. It's a downer. It's, uh, it's normally used as an anesthetic, and I'm pretty sure most of these are characters we're going to meet later. Well, even Jackie Ma's got a portrait on here. But yeah, ketamine is normally an anesthetic. Like uh, morphine, it has a real medical use. And uh, like morphine, you can... Uh, people use it to get high. So. Here's Ming. Over by the night market area. How's your connect? You getting everything you need? No, man. I haven't been back to Bobstar since I left Dog Eyes. I'm not sure how he's gonna take it. Want me to talk to him? Yeah, yeah. I'm just about out. So grab my next shipment and make sure everything is cool. Yep. Since Ming works for uh, Winston now, it's uh, a little awkward well, with the whole, um, you know, infighting between Dog Eyes and. Winston. And you know, it's it's only two hundred meters away, I'll I'll just drive over there. No need to cut this. Yeah, here we are. The basketball court. He always drives with a helmet, unless he has a hat on. Hey, pops are around. What would a nice looking boy like you want with my boyfriend? That's him slouching over there. Cush must be soaked. You pop star? He's asking. Look, I work for Winston. Dirty Ming's operating in our territory. I want to make sure he's supplied. Sure, I'll fix him up. But, but what? I gotta get paid. In advance, I'll make it easy for you. A couple of dead beat junkies owe me money. Guys used a deal for me before they became the only best customer. Collect what they owe me, and I'll hook your man up. Oh yeah, something else that's fun about uh, ketamine. It also causes short-term amnesia. So it's also used as a date rape drug. Like I said, fun. They want me to grapple and environment. I'm the god of unpaid debts. Pop star prayed real hard this morning. Time for you fuckers to pay up. What I don't know. That is a good line. 
Uh, okay, you, you do that way. <laughs> anyway, didn't get a triad bonus for that since we're working for the cops this time. What the fuck is this? He's okay. One of Winston's guys. Yeah? Guess Son Oni will take on anyone these days. Man, guys always gotta be throwing shade. Who's that? Hang Shen. Best shit in Hong Kong. You got my money? Got your money. Here's your package. Tell Ming to stick with girls over 14 this time. It's the cops. Stay cool. Hey, you two! Come over here! Let's go! Stop! I got a rest! And that's how you deal with cops. Since obviously, uh, just kicking the crap out of them is not what you would want to be doing. So instead, Wei's got this special uh, anti grapple move where he. Ah, uh, crap. Where he uh, steals their handcuffs and uses it on them. They do get out. You, you saw that. But it certainly does buy you some time. Speaking of buying time, these guys are riding my ass. <laughs> I gotta be careful about taking these corners. But hey, you are allowed to um, smash cop cars. <laughs> Not the dividers, but the cop cars, certainly. Not uh, the other cars, but the cop cars, yes. And if they should happen to hit something because of something you did, that does not count against you. That's a bonus. That was it. Inspector Tang? What have you found? I got enough to bust Popstar. But I also met a supplier, a guy named Fang Shen. Find out where he hangs out, and I'll see if I can get something on him. I'll get back to you. You need food? I got good dogs. Yeah, I could use some food. My duck has healing power. Serve it up. You out, make you feel good. You want some? You know he's not he's not wrong. Like a new man. Like because of these bonuses, his duck really does have healing powers. Ah, oh, come on, man. Two handfuls out of a takeout container. Ah, whatever. Back to Ming. Our local ground level dealer. Oh, I lead over. Got the stuff, right? Don't worry, I got your stuff right here. Now I can start making money again. Yep, only two badges. But hey! Look at that! Yeah, when you do the police missions, you get a lot more cop experience. Now, what was that surveillance I just got? Let's see here. Sucks that they don't put these in order. I think this is the one, though. But yeah, in exchange for not getting much cop experience from main missions, you get a ton of it from these side missions. And technically, these aren't really side missions anyway. Because uh, you kind of have to do them, and the plot assumes that you do. Alright, and uh, th this is a ways away, so I'm going to try and use a taxi. Turns out I failed to use the taxi. In the intended way. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, you, you gotta hold down the enter a car button. I just pressed it, and that's hijacking. Whoops. Well, luckily, he's just around the corner anyway. Ah, oh, damn it. I was on the mission just now? Funny he didn't register the theft then. Right, anyway, this is all to teach you how to use a new collectible. Sort of collectible. So, first thing we gotta do, gotta beat some of these guys. That grapple automatically failed because that guy's got a weapon. That's sort of part of their deal. 
Like, there are special abilities you can get, and under certain conditions, you can, um, grapple someone with a weapon. And the reason that's a special ability is because when you grapple someone with a weapon, you take it from them. Weapons don't last forever, but they do a lot of damage. Alright. So you can hack the camera from this uh, electronics box here. Although, I, I really do have to wonder about the conceit of this. Why are we hacking into the Hong Kong Police Department cameras here? I mean, even if we are an undercover cop, would we not have access to the codes if we went to the station? Or would our contacts not have access to these codes? Anyway, that's just a mastermind game. If you know what that is, then um, it's easy enough to do. If you don't know what it is, it explains it for you, so I, I didn't bother. It's a mastermind game. It's what you need to know. Alright. Now, the way it works is that after you've hacked a camera, you can access its feed from your home computer, which is hooked up to the strangely nice TV, and that's why it's a strangely nice TV. It's because it's owned by the police department. Alright. Well, we saw, um... I forget his name. But yeah, it actually started us pointed at him. And technically we could, uh can have the police come in and arrest any of these guys. And uh, the, the, the game would just keep on going. The thing is, we would get less experience from doing so. Or less money. Or both. And I kind of want money and experience, so... I, I'm uh, hunting around, just looking for confirmation. And, oh look, there it is. In-game confirmation. The cheapest kind there is. Yeah, if you waste too much time, the game just says, Look, here, it's this guy. Which is, I don't know, kind of helpful for the first one here. But there is a secret. We got them. We got them. Inspector Tang, this is Wei. Fang Shan is down. Popstar will have to reach out to another supplier. I'm thinking we bag them both at once. I agree. Now, if I'm going to get close to him, I'm gonna need a good disguise. Can you have your people send something over? All right. Keep me informed. Got it. All right, making progress. And yeah, cop experience. Now I can buy something. So the two cop trees are. Basically, uh, vehicle stuff and firearms stuff. Yep, yeah, you can see, uh, you can figure out which one's which here. Slim Jim is pretty fun. Basically, it means that when you uh, steal a car that's not moving, you can, uh, When you steal a car that's parked, you do not set off the alarm, even if it has one. That means uh, less chance that the cops will notice you. Alright, but now that I did that first surveillance camera, all these other surveillance cameras have popped up. Uh, I'm trying to get him into the phone booth, but the wall works. Alright. You. 
Into the wall. Okay. Um, uh, into the wall again. Okay. Into the phone booth. But you can see the counter there. Thugs remaining. Five. By the way, the big guy is a grappler. You cannot grapple him without suffering the consequences, unless you are in face mode and have an ability, I believe. Yep, that's his special, one of his special grappling moves right there. And that's me pressing the wrong buttons. Wipe out. So, yeah, you spend some money in medical pills and you get teleported to the nearest hospital or clinic. This would be a medical clinic, apparently. And, uh, the place I'm going disappeared for now, but it, it'll show up after a few seconds. It's kind of weird like that. Plus, it's not a proper mission, so I need to get close enough for it to pop up on the mini-map for me to use the, uh, the... the the hot key to uh, make it show up. Right, but yeah, the light blue shields are the drug busts. Basically, cameras where there is actively crime going on. By the way, thought of a more efficient way to take on these guys. I don't know, I think it's working. I started at 7 and now there's only 5 folks remaining. Yeah, other bad thing about the grapplers is that they've got a ton of health. Alright, this is just taking too long now. And I'm kind of stuck down here. But okay. Yeah, you, you may see more than 4 thugs around here. The way it works is that once you've gotten the counter down, the rest of the thugs will run away. Well, I should say that on the plus side, that one grappler is stuck behind the car. And I think some of the others are stuck in that car over there. Ah, oh, damn it! Alright, I'll, I'll move. I'll move the car. Run over the mo motorcyclist while I'm at it. Ah, oh, damn it, he pulled me out. Alright, dude, you and me. Yeah, that's the thing about the grapplers, is uh, to get away from them, or to uh, counter their moves, you, you can't just use the counter button, you've got to do a quick time event, because they aren't using a normal strike, they are grappling you. Okay, one more guy. How about you? You seem easier to reach than the guy that's, uh, you know, on the staircase there. Alright. Yeah, and by defeating the thugs, you get face experience. And hey, what do you know? Everything just got more useful, and the uh, health regeneration from food lasts two-thirds of the bar. Takes up two-thirds of the... Uh, of the circle instead of just one third. Right, anyway, next step is to hack the camera. Now the camera is flashing there, but the, uh, that's not where the box is. Uh, to, uh, whoops. Huh, didn't take any damage. Yeah, so the key is that you've got this, you know, power line. And if you... Ah, oh, damn it. It's, of course it's back up there. Yeah, follow the yellow power line. All the way to the box. Wherever it might be. And oh! It's hiding back here. 
This is actually one of the trickier ones to find. The rest are easier than this. Did I leave this in? Probably shouldn't have. You got, you got the gist of it the first time. Huh. Odd number. Damn. Maybe I left it in because it was a novelty. Because that was weird. Alright, so, uh... You know, having done that, I can go back here. I can look at the surveillance system. <laughs> hey, look, there's the taxi. And once again, you're trying to look for one guy in particular. And, um... They're usually up to a, a certain thing, like uh, dealing, looking in the back of a car, that sort of thing. But here's the real clue. All the dealers look the same. All the dealers have the same character model. All of them. This is the first generic one, so I don't know that yet. But there is always only one guy in a nice suit, a relatively nice suit. And he is always the dealer. So after this, drug busts are going to be relatively simple. We got them. We got them. Giving me plenty of cop experience and plenty of money. Oh yeah. Some of them are a little harder to find than others, or at least harder to reach. And a few of them happen in gun zones. So I thought I would show you, you know, how I'm going to be handling this. You may notice that the indicator changed from a, uh, a controller to uh, keyboard buttons. That is because this game has seamless transitions between using the controller and the keyboard. Which is good for me, because I am much more accurate with a mouse than I am with a controller joystick. You can see me racking up the headshots here. It is kind of annoying that the uh, the game assumes that you're using a controller, so you've got... It, it sort of forces you to follow the, uh, the enemies when they move. But aside from that, yeah, this is how I'm going to be handling firearms. I'm going to be setting the controller down and shooting at people using the mouse and keyboard. Because I can. Because this game lets me. Man, still th six more thugs remaining. Just get rid of that guy. Looks like they're sort of... The rest are going to be reinforcements coming in from behind me. Coming in from one of these doors that I'm not allowed to go through, but they are. Precisely because I can use them. Oh. Hi there. Yep, there's one of the doors is behind me just on the uh, the dock area out there. Ah, damn it. Out of ammo again. Okay. Ooh, machine pistol. <laughs> it's a little more effective than the regular pistols. Okay, well, there's the flashing camera right there. Oh yeah, and you can also holster a pistol. Keep it on you for a while. And there's the box. Anyway, you know how the rest of this goes. So... I just wanted to show this to you since I was out there, you know, hacking all of the cameras. Well, not all, all of the cameras, but all of the ones that showed up on the regular map, certainly. And after identifying all of the uh, dealers... Like so.
I got up to cop experience level 6. How about I spend that then? By, by pressing the right button. Okay, how about I spend that? Well, I'm not going to be finding firearms for a while yet, so I might as well spend it on vehicle upgrades. Technically, we haven't seen action hijacks yet, but we could do them. I could do them. Nice. Ramming damage increase. We saw me doing that. Well, the last upgrade is for free shotguns and pistols out of the backs of cop cars. And I don't need that yet. So I'll spend the rest into the uh, firearms tree. Oh yeah, remember how I got face for doing these things too? Because it also gave me the face meter disarm. That's what I was talking about earlier. Also, I got uh, 10 health shrines. Just, you know, found them while I was out. But uh, I'll get back to the plot next time. Today's movie was recommended by... Cron... Cron... Cronish? Is that it? You got a lot of consonants at the end of your name there. Fred. Regardless, the name of the film is The Raid. It just so happens to be a Hong Kong comic book adaptation released in 1991. The Story About the Story In America, comic books used to be a vibrant and varied medium. You had your horror, your action, your adventure, your romance, your humor, your whatever. Just like any medium, sequential art has no limits. But because mid-century censorship was kind of crazy, and because colorful images are, in a general sense, appealing to kids, the comic book industry had to neuter themselves with the Self-Censoring Comics Code Authority, created in 1954. For the next 20-odd years and then some, comic books had to stick with the kid-friendly superhero genre, and newspaper comics were stuck with barely their unchallenging humor. The authority is completely dead and buried by this point, but Americans still have this idea that comics are for superheroes, kids, nerds, and nobody else. Meanwhile, in other nations like China, France, and Japan, those last two stereotypes are still sort of held to, but not the part about the superheroes. Oh no. Censorship certainly isn't an American invention, but it was never quite so bad that publishers had to abandon entire genres. In China, comic books are generally called manhua, as opposed to the Japanese term manga. The story of how comic books evolved in China is pretty much the same as how they evolved elsewhere. Mine is America, and even then, our story arc was still fairly similar. After the idea for sequential art caught on a bit after a century ago, it spread across the globe, and everybody started making them. He started out with fairly light-hearted fare, we call them comics in English for a reason, but over time they started to branch out into other genres, and started to explore heavier topics and ideas. Comics fell in popularity as television caught on because both of them are visual, serialized formats, so comics adopted ideas from TV shows and otherwise started depicting things that would be too expensive to film. In Hong Kong, for instance, the late 60s is when TV stations first showed up, and the early 70s became the best years for martial arts manhwas. For a long time in Hong Kong, comic books were really just collected newspaper comic strips rather than an independent format. That started to change in the mid-50s, and today's movie is based on one of the pioneers of the native comic book style. It's called Uncle Choi, and it started out as just another light-hearted comedic story. But as time went on, the series became more serious, especially after the Japanese got involved in story. It basically underwent what's sometimes called Cerebus Syndrome, which takes its name from a cartoony talking aardvark that started out as a parody of sword and sorcery movies, but slowly turned into a serious look at politics and religion over its 27-year run. Incidentally, this shift made Uncle Choi more popular than ever, 
And it was only after a second shift, when the series started to get into super science and James Bond spy stuff, that the comic lost its audience and faded away. Uncle Choi ran for 20 years, so obviously today's film isn't a complete adaptation. Instead, it covers a single story arc that takes place in 1932, back when the King Emperor was a puppet of Japanese-controlled Manchuria. And since I'm sure some of you are asking, Manchuria is the northeastern chunk of China that borders Korea and sits closest to Japan. The movie was a collaboration between two men, director Ching Siu Tang and producer Tsui Hak, both of whom had worked together several times before. Ching was born into the film industry, the son of a Shaw Brothers director. I will be getting to those guys eventually. And by 1991, he was well established as a successful director with works like Duel to the Death and A Chinese Ghost Story. Sui Hark, on the other hand, was born in Vietnam to an ethnically Chinese family and lived in the United States for a while before settling in Hong Kong in 1977, just in time to become a director and a hands-on producer during the 80s, the golden age of Hong Kong cinema. Both men are still active today, though Tsui more so than Ching. The story. We begin with a credit scene that makes it very clear that this story began as a comic book. And for the first scene, we zoom in on a comic panel. The year is 1932, and the location is occupied Manchuria. The opening scene is an assassination attempt on Emperor Puyi, puppet of the Japanese, but it's just here to set the tone, so I'll move on. With a flip of the page, we change locations to the home front. A bunch of locals and our protagonist, Uncle Choi, run through a jungle. They scale down a dam on their way home so that Uncle Choi, a doctor, can care for some wounded patients, but Choi is caught halfway down by an enemy biplane. So Uncle Choi waits for the plane to make a second pass, lights a big pack of dynamite he happened to have in his bag, and explodes the dam so that the water will smash the biplane. And in the next scene, the group complete their journey to the camp by swinging on vines, like Tarzan. So that's the kind of movie we're in for here. Uncle Choi reaches the camp, and after a brief recovery, he's led to some disguised Republican Chinese soldiers, many of whom are sick and dying. Their leader, a colonel, explains that they were the victims of an enemy gas attack, and as Choi tries to cure him, the colonel urges Lieutenant Meng Taihui to pick up where he left off, cross the border into Manchuria, and destroy the factory that's manufacturing the gas. After the colonel dies, Uncle Choi offers to go with the soldiers, since he used to be in the army himself, but Lieutenant Mang tells the old man to go home. Uncle Choi actually does go home for a while, wondering what to do, but then he gets out his big-ass Chinese broadsword and practices a few forms with it. He leaves a note with his adoptive daughter Nancy that says he's going to be gone for a while, but she was awake when he left the note, so she gets out her Chinese spear and goes after him. At the border of Manchuria, Uncle Choi almost gets caught with his sword, and Nancy is about to throw a stone at the guards to distract them, but then a boy with a slingshot beats her to it, and then both kids run away together. When Nancy gets back to following Choi, the boy sticks with her. Uncle Choi enters a feeding tent where he is distinctly unwelcome. Turns out there's some dispute between the two mining gang bosses called Big Nose and Bobo Bear, and they want to know who he works for. Choi gets literally stuck between them, and after they try to bribe him, thinking he works for the other guy, a fight breaks out. To make a long story short, things escalate quickly, and Choi, Nancy, and the kid get the hell out of there as fast as they can. Choi smuggles himself in a truck with supplies bound for the royal palace, so Nancy and the kid, nicknamed Smarty, sneak into another truck, full of unconscious miners being sent to a Mr. Saka for experimentation. Choi's truck is full of meat for the palace kitchen, so Choi gets inside as a teamster and then steals a chef's outfit so he can stick around. While there, he discovers that half the kitchen staff is actually Lieutenant Mang and his men in fake beards. Choi asks if they're there because this is the chemical weapons factory, but Mang is actually there to meet a female spy. Choi and Mang get stuck serving the Emperor and watching a big musical number. And then Choi has to put on a noodle-making show, because he put on the noodle-maker's name tag. The show doesn't go well. 
However, it goes well enough that the Emperor doesn't notice anything until he starts eating a fake beard in his soup. So the guards line the chefs up to check for fake beards, and then one of them grabs a hostage and a firefight breaks out. The hostage turns out to be Tina, their contact, and an Imperial aide, and she happens to know that the actress, Kim Pik Fai, is actually a Japanese spy named Kawashima Yoshiko. The surviving soldiers escape to the kitchen, so Tina turns on the gas, they all climb into middle barrels, and when Tina explodes the gas, the barrels go flying safely away from the palace. Tina and Choi's barrel falls into a tent, where the two mining bosses are blatantly cheating at cards and waving guns, and a fight scene breaks out when the guards arrive, having followed the barrel's trajectory. When Bobo Bear gets angry enough to shoot a guard, Choi rescues him. Bobo doesn't really want to help the Republicans, but at this point, he doesn't really have a choice. During their escape, the three happen by the prison cell where Nancy and the miners are, so Choi uses some more dynamite to free them, and they all get away. However, Nancy had to shout Uncle Choi a bunch to get his attention, so when the Japanese commander hears about this, he sends a squad of combat ninjas to find this Uncle Choi and kill him. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Mang sets out to destroy the train supplying the chemical weapons factory. Mang tells Choi to stay behind again, but Choi goes after him, Nancy goes after Choi, and Smarty goes after Nancy. Tina returns to the palace with Bobo Bear so that she can spy on Kawashima and the Japanese commander, Masa. And Bobo goes along with this because he is hopelessly infatuated with the actress. Commander Masa is Kawashima's secret lover, so he's not too happy with Bobo. But then Kawashima isn't happy with Tina since the Emperor promised her to Masa. So it's pretty tense all around. Some comedic misunderstandings put Bobo in Masa's bed and Tina underneath it when Kawashima slings him. And then Masa shows up, and then the Emperor shows up, and it just becomes this great big mess. Words can't do it justice. It's a classic rapid-fire comedy mix-up. You just have to see it for yourself. But ultimately, Tina finds a map to the weapons factory. Bobo and Tina get found out. Tina gets shot and Bobo carries her as they escape the palace. Bobo Bear's escape takes him to the train tracks where Lieutenant Mang is setting his explosives, so Uncle Choi, Nancy, and Smarty reveal themselves to get Bobo some help. They ambush and kill the pursuing soldiers, but then some biplanes covered in ninjas strafe their position, and everybody runs. Big Nose's gang happen to show up in time to join the fight on the Manchurian side, so Bobo fights them off and fully commits to helping the Republicans. Meanwhile, Uncle Choi and Nancy are killing the ninjas with their traditional weapons, since, as ninjas, they naturally prefer swords themselves. Finally, the supply train arrives, and Nancy blows up the tracks just in time to derail it. One of the train cars stays on the track, however, and Big Nose chases Uncle Choi onto it so that they can have a fight scene together. But then the car derails and explodes, and everyone thinks that both men are dead. But no, they're both alive. And the next morning, they both escape several kinds of death to climb back up to the rails. Big Nose turns out to be an ungrateful asshole at that point, so Uncle Choi leaves him in disgust. Bobo Bear has fallen for Tina after everything that happened, so while she recovers from her wound, and Uncle Choi shows back up without any fanfare, he gets Nancy's help in writing a love letter. But when Bobo sneaks it to her bedside, the lieutenant ends up getting it and thinking it's from Tina. Then some more people end up getting it... <laughs> I think you know where this is going. Fortunately, Nancy manages to clear everything up in the end. Once Tina recovers from her wound, all the main characters sneak into the chemical weapons factory for the titular raid. But oh no, they get locked in the chemical testing room. Masa and Kawashima take a moment to interrogate the group about the nature of Uncle Choi, but they end up more confused than ever. Big Nose is there too, so he and Bobo Bear spend some time trying to spit on each other through the glass. But when Masa turns on the gas and laughs, Big Nose grows a conscience and opens the doors, taking a bullet in the shoulder for his trouble. A fight scene erupts, with rifles, swords, and machine guns. Even the ninjas show up for a few seconds of melee action. Big Nose and Bobo Bear end up meeting and teaming up, but when they encounter the Japanese bad guys, they both get shot. 
But before they're killed, Uncle Choi and Tina show up just in time to fight the antagonists one-on-one. -on -one. As the two mining bosses light some dynamite, Masa grabs a machine gun and just unloads on the whole world. He even hits Kawashima, and he locks her outside when he hides in a tank after the gas doors explode. She dies when he tries to escape, but the protagonists hook his tank to a crane so that he swings around and destroys the factory. And then Uncle Choi finishes things by throwing the last of their explosives into the tank's cannon. There are a few short scenes of the characters continuing the war effort after the raid, but this is the end of the story. Final thoughts. First off, let me just say that the ADR is strong with this one. ADR stands for Automated Dialogue Replacement, which is a fancy way of saying that the actors re-recorded their lines in a studio for better sound quality. And as a side effect, the voices and lip movements don't really match up, even though I got a subtitled version instead of an English dub for once. But that's how it goes in the world of cheap filmmaking. And even though the film's budget is obvious in the cheap sets, obvious wire effects, the clear use of miniatures for a movie made in 1991, and the fact that the video and audio were recorded separately, I can tell why people kept suggesting this movie in the short time that this Let's Play has been live. The money wasn't there, but the heart definitely was. The people behind this movie were real Uncle Choi fans, and they threw in everything they could. Classic comedy routines with people shuffling through hiding spots, and unsigned love letters making the rounds. Gun battles with lots of bloody squibs and sparking bullet effects, and even a few weapon duels with soldier ninjas, despite the fact that the lead actor was in his 40s and would retire from acting after this film. Wikipedia says he went into real estate afterwards. Go figure. But something you need to remember about this movie is that it's a lot like France making a comedy about the resistance during the German occupation of World War II. Except that the Japanese occupation may have been worse, all things considered. But then I really shouldn't get into comparing war atrocities. That's... that's never a productive argument. Suffice it to say that the raid, and by extension the Uncle Choi Manhua, has a lot in common with Mel Brooks's The Producers especially in depicting Emperor Puyi as an oblivious bumbler. He may have been a Japanese puppet in 1932, but let's just say that his hands were not clean. Not much else to add outside of that. The characters are all archetypes, but the actors portray them well. The jokes are all old, but you can always laugh at an old joke with a good presentation. And while the bad guys never seem to know how to aim and never get a fatal shot even when they do hit someone, the movie never pretends to have serious emotional stakes. There are other action comedies out there that are more worth seeing, but if you happen across the raid, it's certainly worth your time. Thanks for joining me again for today's film review, and I hope I'll see you next time as we head down to Thailand for a movie about a Buddha statue and one man who will kick anyone's ass to get it back.